my grandfather bought the property in the early 1920s. He bought 600 acres from a timber company. It had been turpentined, and he immediately began converting it to farmland, and he farmed cotton and tobacco. And then um, after his death, my father began to uh, peanut farm a, lo a lot of it. And then his job was um, so intense, he, he was a circuit judge here, that he um, began to uh, switch over to a cattle operation. And um, then when, upon his death, Philip and I and my sister inherited and, and we began, we once again began, he began the timber operation as we, you know, began to plant the trees. So we did a clear cut on the property and uh, then we got with Mike at the uh, Alabama Forestry Commission and he came and wrote a plan for us and we uh, uh, immediately planted back in Loblolly Pines and uh, uh, that got us started. But, well, we've got 160 acres really in, uh, in trees and we've got about 19 years with Loblollies and we did a thinning back in 2003 and then in 2004, we were blessed to have Ivan came through and uh, really played havoc on us uh, because of the thinning out. We had trees standing out there that had a place for the hurricane to come through and we, we suffered a good bit of damage. And from that and Alex being involved, we, uh, we thought about clear cutting again and starting over. But uh, with Mike and Alex, we got to talking about it and we've come in and underplanted with longleaf pine. This was the area that got hit pretty hard in 2004 with Hurricane Ivan. And you know, we had select cut in this area and then the storm came through and what we had left for crop trees, they got laid down pretty badly. But uh, you know, it was a kind of a mixed blessing in that uh, we were able to come back and start planting longleaf, which is actually better for this soil than, uh, than it was for loblolly. And, um, you know, Philip, that's kind of a, a almost foreign concept here in South Alabama to uh, plant uh, multi-species of pine on, and especially multi-age uh, pine and manage that on the same ground. Uh, you know, most of these uh, programs have been geared to uh, clear cutting and planting yeah. all age, same species, but here we have an opportunity to uh, save the trees that were already grown uh, to substantial size and a, a valuable product and then come back, plant a long leaf, which is well adapted to the fire and the management regime needed to keep this uh, forest and this stand healthy. We've done uh, we had several different harvests. Uh, 2003, we started harvesting the, uh, the uh, loblollies. And then uh, 2006, we, did, uh, we, we harvested the rest of the loblolly. And we had some areas where the loblolly were, uh, 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 were not producing, uh, showing any growth at all. And uh, we went in and clear cut some of those areas. Uh, but by uh, opening up the area, uh, we see the crowns are filling out, we, uh, the trees are uh, getting greater diameter on them, and, uh, and then coming back in with the uh, long leaves, uh, we've now gotten into a burn regiment. Uh, we, uh, we started last year, of course, cleaning up after the cuttings, we, uh, we did some burning for site prep. But then last year we, we really began to do some burning. We probably burned about a third of our property. Alex, you just finished burning this uh, last week, I believe. July 20th, 2009. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, as you know, Philip, I'm a big proponent of growing season burn because you can control a lot of your woody shrubs uh, real well with a growing season burn, especially you know, May, June, July, these kind of months, and this year has has been especially good because we've had this these frequent rains, so we can get a couple of days off of a rain when the humidity goes down to about 40 percent. We can come uh, in with a burn and uh, and get a real good control like we did here. Now your blue jack oak, turkey oak, they'll survive this kind of burn, and and you'll have them 
uh, come back or if uh, not survive uh, totally. But uh, we expect a lot of the grasses in forest to come back in here yeah. between now and the fall. We have four food plots and two of the food plots are primarily uh, fall and winter food plots. We will we'll plant uh, uh, wheats and oats and then uh, and a third one is wheats and oats. And then we've got a few others uh, that we've plant, planted a uh, brown top millet in for the quail. Uh, last year we planted some uh, uh, grain sorghum with uh, iron clay peas. And this year I've had a, a, a client gave me some uh, American joint vetch and I planted that with some brown top millet. I can recall when I started dating Gail that there were a lot of quail in this area. And then uh, they, they started disappearing. And we went for a number of years there where we didn't see quail, but probably the last six years we've we've heard them we've seen some coveys but i'm i'm hopeful that this year i don't know how many coveys we've got we've, there's some across the road and we have a number on both side uh both sides of the house here so uh, uh, it's made a difference since we've started our timber management as far as bringing on the wildlife and bringing them back philip i understand the gopher tortoise is one of your species you're managing that's right. Uh, you know, last year we had the uh, American Forest Foundation down and they were interested in what we were doing with the, the, the gopher tortoise. And uh, I think on our property, we've got about 30 burrows. Uh, now, not all of them are, are habitated, but uh, uh, we've really seen a lot of them uh, coming and going. And uh, we've, we've even, not far from here, had a uh, gopher that we found some uh, eggshells at the entrance. Um, I hope the predators didn't get it, but uh, uh, they're interesting creatures. And I don't think we realized how important they are ecologically until we started this, this habitat management. And it's, um, you know, we've always, all my life we've enjoyed the gophers, but we never really realized, I didn't realize how, how they kept the balance. One thing that was so interesting to me uh, last fall when we had the, a field day from the American Forest Foundation, one of the professors from Auburn was here to talk about the gophers and the benefits and all. And I was telling her how, as a child, how much fun I had with the gophers because, you know, we'd play with them and they're, they're so docile and so much fun. And she was, we had some, Phil put his game camera at the mouth of one of the, of the gopher burrows and we had some really good pictures. And we had the one that was really large. And she was able to, to some things I had told her, she was able to identify it. And she believes that that is one of the, the gophers that I had as a child. And it was so, because she said they would live to be sometimes 80 years old. And it was like, oh, it's my long lost friend. Here we are, you know, so. You know, we enjoy the farm. But it's so much fun for people to come to the farm and enjoy it with us and to see people experience, especially these little kids that come and they've never seen the, the horse close up or the mule close up or whatever. And to see somebody learn something and you know, part of, part of life is, is passing on to the next generation. And so how wonderful it is that we have the opportunity, we're so blessed to have that opportunity to share. Mike and his, his group with the, with the Forestry Commission have been just wonderful with us and we've also utilized Farm Services Office and that's been really good. And you know, the hurricane was devastating to us, but without their assistance we would still have trees on the ground. But in a weird sort of way it was actually a blessing because had we not had the hurricane, I don't think that we would have had the, the wherewithal, the backbone to have clear cut and to have replanted. We have put things into place for it to be managed. Um, our daughter, of course, will, will be the fourth generation to own it. She understands exactly what she is to do. Uh, we told her the first thing she did to do would be call Mike and Alex because they would tell her what to do. But she understands, and they have been so kind to spend time with her and help her to see the big picture. And she sees the big picture. So hopefully she will be able to, whether she ever lives here or not, she'll be able to continue it. To me, this is home and it's a peacefulness that you don't get any other place. You have a bad day and you come walk, walk the timber road and it's, it's peace and you, you find your center, you find your core. And uh, I, I wouldn't want to be any place else.